a vulnerable grandmother brutally attacked in her own home. She's been murdered. A six-year-old eyewitness identifies the killer. He was the person who did this. The man is convicted and sentenced to life in prison. It was just an offensive crime committed against two very vulnerable people. But one woman is convinced he's innocent. He did not do this. She's not a lawyer. She's not a cop. She's the daughter of the murdered woman, the wife of the accused. How can that be? What the heck is going on here? Barberton, Ohio, just outside Akron, is named the Magic City. But with a population of less than 30,000, it has small town America written all over it. And this is the town where 58 year old Judy Johnson raised her two daughters, Melinda and April. My mother, Judy, she'd give you a shirt off her back if, if you needed her help. She was very loving and caring. She was kooky, funny, had a temper. But Judy was not lucky in love. Several troubled marriages culminated in a permanent injury. She suffered a lot of domestic abuse. And this one particular time, it actually caused her to lose her eyesight. She was beaten severely. And she only regained a little bit of sight in her left eye, but she had absolutely none in her right eye. And Judy's relationship struggles had a profound impact on both of her daughters. She um, would say to me, you are a good person. You are beautiful. Don't live like I lived. At age 18, Melinda married high school sweetheart Clarence Elkins. I thought this is my chance to create the life that I wanted to live, marriage, family, children, stability. 17 years later, Melinda's marriage to Clarence has given her two teenage sons and a flood of second thoughts. Yeah, there was a lot of red flags that I didn't see in the beginning. Red flags that Judy Johnson spoke about freely. My mom did not hold back on what she thought. She didn't feel as if Clarence was really giving that 100%, and she couldn't stand that. My mother, Judy, wanted nothing more than my sister to leave Clarence. April was also raising a family. In 1991, she gave birth to daughter Brooke. Brooke was the only granddaughter. My mom had all grandsons, so it was really special when Brooke was born. They had a bond like no other. They were always together. On June 6, 1998, six-year-old Brooke is spending the night at Judy's house for the last time. While Brooke sleeps in the only bedroom, Judy has gone to bed on the living room sofa. Just hours before daybreak, someone enters the tiny one-bedroom house. She tries in vain to fend off the attacker. But Judy Johnson is beaten to death. Young Brooke is awakened by the noise. When she sees the intruder, she runs back to bed and hides, hoping he won't find her. But she's not so lucky. Incredibly, six-year-old Brooke, who was left for dead, survives the attack. When I woke up, I went to the bathroom and grabbed one of my grandma's robes. I tried to wake her up, and she wouldn't wake up. I couldn't find the phone, so I went and pressed the page button, and I heard it outside. Brooke retrieves the phone and calls the house of a friend, but gets only the answering machine. I'm trying to tell you this, but my grandma died, and I need somebody to get my mom for me. I'm all alone. Somebody to 
Moments later, Brooke staggers to the home of Judy's next door neighbor. She was my grandma's neighbor for a long time. I played with her kids almost every day. The neighbor, Tanya Brazil, answers the door. I asked her, can you take me home? My grandma's dead. A mile and a half away, Brooke's parents are still asleep. I heard this tremendous banging, and I knew it was early, so I immediately looked at the clock. I went downstairs, and I met Brooke at the door. I don't really remember the ride to my house. It was just a big blur to me. Tanya let Brooke in, and she left. That's when Brooke told me that my mom was laying in front of the couch, stabbed, and that she was dead. I woke up my husband, and I told him that Brooke was here, and she was covered in blood, and that something was wrong with my mom. He immediately gets up and told me to wait there, that he would send the cops to the house if something was wrong. OK, sir, just calm down. My mother-in-law has been stabbed. She's laying here on the floor. She's dead. 40 miles away in the rural community of Magnolia, Judy's other daughter, Melinda, is just waking up. Her husband, Clarence, is with her. We heard a car flying up the driveway. We had a pretty long driveway. And this Carroll County Sheriff deputy came through the front door, and he asked me um, to step outside, my son Brandon and I. Then he asked me what my mother's name was. And I said, Judy. And I said to him, is my mom OK? And he said, no, she's been murdered. They had gotten a call from Barberton Police Department that my mom had been stabbed in her home and that Brooke was saying that Clarence did it. Six-year-old Brooke has identified Melinda's husband as the assailant. Well, I asked Brooke who did this, and she told me Clarence. And I said, Clarence who? She said, Uncle Clarence. Uncle Clarence, the son-in-law Judy Johnson had it in for. Elkins is taken into custody and charged with the crimes. When word circulated as to what happened to Mrs. Johnson and to Brooke, the community was alarmed. It was a disturbing, hideous crime committed against two very vulnerable people. It was certainly a daunting investigation that the small town police department was about to undertake. Is Clarence Elkins the sadistic killer? He did not do this. How could you stick up for someone that just killed your mother? Or is the real murderer still at large? This was a killer who was totally out of control. Six-year-old Brooke Sutton has witnessed the brutal beating that killed her grandmother. She's also attacked, but miraculously survives. I need somebody to get my mom for me. A mom alone. At Akron's Children's Hospital, Brooke is treated for her injuries and interviewed by police and social workers. She tells them what she told her mother, that the attacker was her uncle Clarence, the murder victim's son-in-law. What the police had was a young child who was supposed to be killed but survived. She's an eyewitness to a crime and identify her uncle. She's seen the face often throughout her entire life. Clarence Elkins is arrested and charged with Judy Johnson's murder and the attack on Brooke. Police turn the Elkins home inside out in search of evidence, but find nothing. There wasn't any physical evidence that linked Clarence to the crime scene because he did not do this. But police doubt Clarence's alibi. We had an argument on Saturday evening. He ended up leaving and uh, going to a couple of bars. He got home approximately 2.40 in the morning. The testimony of the coroner was that the, the murder took place sometime between 2.30 and 5.30. Had Clarence gone out again? 
this time to settle the score with his mother-in-law? The theory is that he was drunk that night, became angry, stewing about this meddling in his life and his marriage. Police theorized that Clarence Elkins, who drove 40 miles with the intention of murdering his mother-in-law and silencing her once and for all. The police felt that he somehow left in the middle of the night, and I didn't hear him. But during the night, I had actually laid down in the living room on the couch because my son Brandon was sick. The car was right outside of the living room window. We had a long driveway, so you could hear if a car was coming up or leaving. Could it be done? Certainly it could be done. There was a narrow time frame where he could go in there and commit the crimes and get back home in time to be seen by Melinda. The police had an eyewitness, and it was a solid case from their perspective. While Clarence awaits trial, Barberton detectives hit the streets to carry out their investigation. You had a situation where it's a small police department where murders are not common. Basically, what they're going to do is take the eyewitness account and build their case around that. Detectives interview Judy Johnson's acquaintances, and several of them are subpoenaed. But Melinda Elkins, Judy's eldest daughter, is convinced that her young niece is mistaken. I was 150% sure that Clarence was innocent of my mother's murder and attack on my niece. I just felt that she was very confused about what had happened. But Melinda Elkins is alone in this belief, and taking a stand for her husband's innocence bears a heavy cost. My entire family at that point felt that Clarence was guilty. There's no ifs, ands, or buts on their part. And I thought, how could you dare stick up for someone that just killed your mother, our mother? Brooke was not the type of child that would make up a lie like that or even think of a lie like that. The interpretation in the community and the media was that you had a, a woman here who was standing by her man at the expense of her own mother. In May of 1999, 11 months after his arrest, Clarence goes to trial for the murder of Judy Johnson and the assault on Brooke Sutton. But because she's a defense witness, Melinda is barred from entering the courtroom. I was frustrated, devastated, that I was not allowed in there. This is a trial about my mother's murder. Uh, Clarence is on trial for his life, and I'm sitting out in a hallway by myself. Inside the courtroom, witnesses for the prosecution paint a sinister picture of Clarence Elkins prosecution was portraying that this is a nasty relationship between Judy Johnson and Clarence Elkins, that she was the meddling mother-in-law, he had had enough with her, and he wanted her gone. But the most compelling aspect of the prosecution's case is their star witness, then seven-year-old Brooke Sutton. The prosecutor asked me, have I seen the guy that killed my grandma? And I said, yes. And I pointed out my uncle. Clarence's defense team questioned Brooks' reliability. But it's just, I think for a jurist, it's just very hard to overcome the fact that a young girl is pointing a finger and identifying her uncle Clarence as the killer. The trial lasts just three weeks, and the jury deliberations a single day. The jury came back with their decision. They found him guilty of a murder, and every count against him they found him guilty of after that. And I just collapsed. Clarence Elkins is handed down multiple life sentences and is not eligible for parole until 2054. I turned around and I looked at April and I said, you know he didn't do this. In my head, I could not understand how my sister was sticking up for him. It was over after that point. The big loser in all this was Melinda Elkins. She had lost her entire family support system based on the position that she took during this trial that her husband was innocent. Scorned by the public, the press, and her own family, Melinda is left to raise her two sons alone. But she refuses to accept the court's ruling. 
she files appeal after appeal and petitions the Ohio Supreme Court to review the case. Melinda Elkins was up against the state of Ohio. Um, 99 out of 100 murder convictions stand. Every legal appeal is denied. At rock bottom, she has one idea left. Find the killer myself. Melinda's plan? To lure in the most dangerous suspects using herself as the bait. At the gravesite of her murdered mother, Melinda Elkins makes a solemn vow. I said to her, I promise you, I will find out who did this to you if it takes me the rest of my life. And with her husband in prison and authorities no longer investigating the murder, Melinda is determined to solve it herself. I had no experience investigating a homicide, obviously, but anyone could have done a lot better than what Barberton Police Department did. Taking her inspiration from a true crime television show, Melinda decides she'll solve the murder using what was then a brand new forensic science, DNA analysis. It was miraculous to me how if you just touch something, you can leave behind your DNA marker, and that can be tested to figure out who you are. And I knew that that was something I was going to have to implement into finding out who did this. I started creating a suspect list, people that had some type of dealing with my mom, with any past of violent crime, they went on my list. Next, Melinda prepares to go undercover. Her plan? Lure in her suspects and steal their DNA. I would find out where they hung out, where they lived, interject myself into their life, and obtain their DNA. I would go to these bars and flirt a little bit and collect their DNA by running my fingers through their hair. A beer bottle or a cigarette butt was good, had saliva. It was a crazy idea, but I did it, because I had to do it. Convinced that the murderer is still at large, Melinda and her sons live in constant fear. My sons were keeping watch at night and had themselves armed with whatever they could use as a weapon had someone tried to break into our home. Meanwhile, Melinda's collection of DNA samples grows. My freezer became the storage unit for this DNA. But Melinda's efforts would stop there. She has no idea what to do next. I needed help. Then, five months after her husband is sent to prison, Melinda finds an extraordinary ally. I came across this organization called Truth and Justice, and I sent them an email requesting some kind of help. They emailed me back, and they said, this sounds like a case for Martin Yant. Yant is a former investigative journalist turned private eye. This guy is world-renowned for solving wrongful convictions. And I asked him to, you know, talk to me about this case, and uh, he got right back to me. Melinda was a very unusual, compelling character. Her one goal was to prove that Clarence was innocent, but an equal goal was to find out who killed her mother. Yant travels from Columbus to the Barberton area to meet with Melinda. I usually try to go back to square one and see what caused investigators to go in one direction and perhaps see if they ignored other evidence or other avenues. Martin said to me, wow, this case uh, is wrong. There was just simply no real consideration that it was anybody other than Clarence. It's one thing for an emotional family to jump to conclusions. Trained observers and investigators should not jump to conclusions. I felt somebody's listening to me finally. Using a Freedom of Information Act request, Yant obtains copies of the police reports. Uh, I noticed a description of a bloody fingerprint on the door jam. And there was only one door into this very small house. And I said, well, that's pretty likely killer's fingerprints. So I filed a second 
public records request on the attempts at identifying that fingerprint. And the police chief responded, the bloody fingerprint was destroyed during the process of trying to lift it. At Martin's urging, Melinda returns to her mother's house and searches the bushes where Brooke found the phone. Melinda started digging around that bush, and she found an old rusted C-clamp. We kind of wondered, was that the murder weapon? And that's not the only clue missed by police. Melinda had mentioned they didn't know what happened to their mother's cat. She found the skeleton of a cat with a string of Christmas lights wrapped around its neck. For Yant, the grisly discovery is another indication that someone other than Clarence Elkins committed the murder. Somebody is really pathological to kill a cat that way. To me, it even made less sense that it would be Clarence. This was a killer who was just totally out of control. Eventually, Yant is able to obtain transcripts of the murder trial and analyze what transpired. The square one, in this case, was Brooke. As I read that testimony, I was struck about how weak her identification was. And under cross-examination, she admitted she never really got a good look at the killer. Everyone seemed to ignore the fact that Brooke had been traumatized. She had been strangled. She had oxygen deprivation. She had a severe blow to the head. And she's a little six-year-old girl. And no one seemed to question that maybe this little girl was confused. Now officially on the case, Martin gives Melinda one of the toughest assignments yet. In order to get access to Brooke, she must end the Cold War between herself and her sister April. I said, we have to try to talk to Brooke and your sister. We have to know how that identification came about and what Brooke thinks now. I didn't have bad feelings against my sister or, or my niece. I just, I was hurt. It's been more than three years since Melinda and her sister have spoken. With Martin Yant at her side, she goes to April's house unannounced. I felt at that point, that's gonna kill me. If she turns me away again. It was about three and a half years since I had seen my sister. She first turned away from me, and I thought, oh, gosh. And she immediately turned around and just hugged me and cried. <laughs> I just broke down, and I just missed her and loved her and was glad that she was there. It was a very emotional moment. I kind of took Brooke aside and explained why we were there. When Martin asks the now nine-year-old Brooke about the murder, he gets much more than he bargained for. Martin asked me if I was sure that Uncle Clarence did it. And I just kind of broke down and said I wasn't sure. She said, I was never really sure. And I said, what? She said, yeah, I said that originally, but then I started having doubts, and I tried to tell the prosecutors. And they kept telling me, no, no, no. We have all this other evidence about Clarence being a bad man. You're doing a good thing, helping us send him to prison. I felt, you know, how, how dare they use her and victimize her all over again? How dare they? They confirmed to me that this case had perpetrated an injustice and that a killer was still on the loose. And if Brooke needed any more evidence, her uncle was innocent. I was looking at a picture of my uncle Clarence, and I noticed that he had blue eyes. Brooke said, Mommy, it couldn't have been Uncle Clarence, because the guy that hurt me doesn't have blue eyes. He has brown. Brooke's revelation sends Melinda back to her suspect list. He really fit the profile. The hunt for Judy Johnson's killer is about to heat up. 
Melinda Elkin's search for suspects in the murder of her mother has had limited success. Three years into her ordeal, Melinda's niece, Brooke Sutton, who witnessed the attack, has confirmed Melinda's suspicion. I kind of took Brooke aside and asked if she was still sure that Uncle Clarence had killed her grandmother. I just broke down and said I wasn't sure. I had kind of come to that conclusion, but to hear her say it was so validating. Now, the chance discovery of a home video may finally lead Melinda to Judy Johnson's killer. A friend of my mom's brought me a wedding video uh, that my mom was in. I noticed this younger guy was very attentive to my mom. And I said, who is that guy? That's Ryle. He had such a crush on your mom. He had asked Judy Johnson to go out, even though there was a 30-year age difference. And this was all shortly before the murder. And Judy Johnson said, you got to be kidding. Melinda, Martin, and April search for clues about their new suspect. She was in the neighborhood at the time of the murder. Also, his roommate told me that he had marks all over his back and stuff, and it looked like fingernail scratches. We knew that some kind of weapon had been used to cause the serious injuries to Judy Johnson, and he had apparently been in some altercations, so he started carrying the upper end of a sawed-off cue stick as protection. It was like a club. Yant obtained surveillance video shot by police outside Judy Johnson's funeral. It showed Rob Rush acting very, very nervous. And it did seem to confirm that he had some scratches on his face. With both Melinda and April in tow, Martin Yant goes to Ryle Rush's place of employment to talk to him. We met with him in a small conference room. We explained that his name had come up as being a possible suspect. He just said that he liked my mom and that he wouldn't have hurt her. But he was very nervous. He could not sit still. He actually would not even look at me. We asked if we could get a DNA sample of his saliva to eliminate him. He refused, which certainly just aroused greater suspicion. The next step, petition the court to order Russia's DNA and provide crime scene evidence to compare with it. Melinda hires defense attorney Elizabeth Kelly. After meeting with Melinda, I was convinced that an innocent man had been convicted. But once a person is convicted, all of the previous rights, that is to say proof beyond a reasonable doubt, innocent until proven guilty, is thrown out the window. The burden is on him to prove that he is innocent. And reviewing courts do not take that standard lightly. Targeting the heart of the prosecution's case against Clarence, Elizabeth Kelly videotapes a statement from then nine-year-old Brooke Sutton. Do you think it was Uncle Clarence? At first, yeah. At first, yeah. But do you think so today? No. She basically said that she was mistaken, and it wasn't Uncle Clarence. In May of 2002, nearly four years after the murder, Elizabeth Kelly presents their case to the same judge who tried Clarence Elkins. We submitted with all faith and confidence to the court that it was Ryle Rush, and certainly not Clarence Elkins, who had done this deed. It's kind of an eye-rolling moment. You know, here's this girl is, you know, years later, all of a sudden remembering eye color. The judge didn't believe the recantation. The prosecutors didn't believe it. And frankly, I think a lot of the public was not swayed by Brooks' retelling of the story now. Seven months later, another huge setback for Melinda. Judge John Adams rules Brooks' recantation unreliable and denies the request to order a DNA sample from Rush. It was frustrating. It was heartbreaking. We had to convince a court. And we fell short of that. It didn't stop um, Melinda Elkins's efforts at all. I think it only energized her more. Every time the courts would disappoint me, the more pissed off I was. 
And the more determined I was to prove them wrong. Melinda launches a website to raise awareness for the cause. There was intense public fascination with this case, aided by the media. Finally, under pressure from media and the public, prosecutors agree to release crime scene evidence to Melinda for DNA testing. Police are ordered to collect Ryle Rush's DNA. He gives it up voluntarily. Now, the truth could be one lab test away, but Melinda is in for a shock. Here we are, looking like total idiots. And a break in the case that no one saw coming. She said, you won't believe this. Something is up here. Melinda Elkins has obtained the DNA of Ryle Rush, the man she believes murdered her mother. Now I needed somebody who knew what to do with the DNA. Our effort at that point was getting some expertise on this revolutionary new technique of DNA testing. Martin Yan pitches Clarence's case to director Mark Godsey at the Ohio Innocence Project. The Ohio Innocence Project follows the same model as the other Innocence Projects, which is a professor supervising law students who roll up their sleeves and dig into cases of people in prison who claim they're innocent, often using DNA testing to see if there's any new evidence that can confirm innocence or guilt. Knowing it's a long shot, Melinda follows up Martin Yant's referral with a call to Mark Godsey at home. At the end of that phone call, he says to me, Melinda, I'm going to put two students on it tomorrow. I was like. <laughs> the Innocence Project sends DNA found at the crime scene to one of the most advanced crime labs in the world, along with DNA samples from both Ryle Rush and Clarence Elkins. At the time that Clarence's trial went forward, the type of DNA testing that could have been used to prove his innocence didn't exist. Uh, but by 2004, a new type of DNA testing called YSTR testing had been developed, which could now let us pull out DNA results previously unattainable. When the DNA from the crime scene is tested, the results are conclusive. The test results come back. They don't match Clarence Elkins. But the same round of tests brings a shocking result. They don't match Royal Rush. What? The new DNA evidence excluding Clarence is presented in court. Throughout their pleadings, they had said, you know, here's your guy. This is the prime suspect. This is who you should have looked at. And, you know, lo and behold, the testing's done, and it excludes Royal Rush. Here we are, looking like total idiots um, to the prosecutors. And they had a field day with that one. The prosecution argues that the DNA evidence eliminating Clarence Elkins may have been contaminated. It, it became very clear that they were going to concede nothing. Incredibly, the court once again rules against Clarence Elkins, denying him a new trial. What the lead prosecutor didn't seem to, to know or care about is that we weren't going to stop. Armed with the DNA from the crime scene, Melinda goes back on the hunt. The only man whose DNA profile could be on both of those victims on that night in question was the perpetrator. I went back to my suspect list. I went back to all my files. I came across a newspaper article, and this name jumped out at me. The article reports on the sentencing of a convicted pedophile by the name of Earl Mann. I remember receiving a phone call from Melinda. She said, you won't believe this. You remember Tanya Brazil. Tanya, Judy Johnson's neighbor, to whom Brooke ran for help the morning after the murder. Tanya's boyfriend and the father of her children had been convicted of raping his daughters. Man had slipped through the cracks of Melinda's exhaustive investigation until now. There was this light bulb that went off that said, whoa, something is up here. Earl Mann had a history of violent crimes, and he had been incarcerated at some point. But Melinda learned at the time of her mother's murder that Earl Mann was free and in that neighborhood. Melinda looks up Earl Mann's rap sheet on the Ohio Offenders Search website. 
the charges that I had found on him fit the profile to me of a person who would commit such a crime against the elderly, against young children. So it all started to tie in. I didn't have any question in my mind. This guy is, is it. But the most alarming revelation is yet to come. He said, yeah, you're a man sitting right over there. Talk about shocking. That was shocking. Melinda Elkins has discovered that a convicted pedophile was living in the house next door to her mother on the night of her murder. The same house six-year-old Brooke Sutton ran to for help. She opened the door and looked really surprised to see me. Melinda's focus is on an unanswered riddle from the morning of the murder. I need somebody to get my mom for me. I'm all alone. Phone records indicate the exact time of Brooke's call for help made moments before knocking on Tanya Brazil's door. I asked her, can you take me home? My grandma's dead. Somebody killed her. Tanya neither went to Judy's house nor called the police before taking Brooke home. My mother-in-law has been stabbed. The 911 call made by Brooke's father reveals just how much time is unaccounted for. What's up? She's dead. There was about an hour between Brooke going to Tanya Brazil and getting her home. Why this tremendous gap? You get a bloody little girl saying somebody killed her grandmother and you don't pick up the phone? Leaving her standing on the porch for 45 minutes, bloody and disheveled and injured, I knew that Earl Mann was probably in that house and Tanya didn't want to let Brooke in there. It's, it's spooky to think that you know, of all the houses in the neighborhood to go to, she chooses the killer's home to seek refuge. Now the events of that morning come into chilling focus. Somebody killed my grandma. By the time they got to her parents' home, it had changed from somebody to Uncle Clarence. How that happened is one of the great mysteries in the case, and I don't think we'll ever know the answer. Me and Tanya, I just can't remember what we talked about. But one thing is certain. Earl Mann has become Melinda's new prime suspect. And getting his DNA could be the toughest challenge yet. Mann is back in prison for a 1999 armed robbery. Then, an uncanny twist of fate. I come to find out that Earl Mann is in the same prison as Clarence. Talk about shocking. That was shocking. I go to visit Clarence. He said, yeah, I know who he is. He's sitting right over there. And uh, he's in the same prison pod with me. I said, this guy is my number one suspect. I'm going after him. Melinda comes up with an idea and an alias, Jay Lee. I wrote him letters um, requesting him to be my pen pal. The whole objective was for him to actually send me a letter back and lick the envelope. If Earl Mann had licked an envelope, the lab would extract his DNA from the adhesive part that he'd licked. Never got anything back from him. Now, running out of options, Melinda and Clarence come up with a new plan. I, I remember asking Clarence, does he smoke? And he's like, well, yeah, he smokes. You know, everybody in there smokes. The plan, steal a cigarette butt from man without him realizing it and capture his DNA. Earl Mann is a violent man with a, with a horrific temper. Had he known that Clarence was trying to gather evidence against him, certainly would have uh, retaliated. Finally, Clarence has the opportunity. He sees Earl Mann leave a cigarette butt in a clean ashtray. And Earl Mann walked out of the room, and Clarence could pick up the cigarette butt with the clean tissue. Just days later, Mann brutally attacks another prisoner and is immediately transferred. Clarence smuggles the DNA evidence out of the prison in a confidential letter to his attorney. And she mailed it to the lab, and they came up with a result within actually 48 hours of receiving it. I'll never forget the day we got the call. Clarence's attorney says, are you sitting down? The DNA from Earl Mann that Clarence risked his life to get has been tested, and the results are back. 
Clarence's attorney called me on the phone and she says, are you sitting down? Yes, why? We have a match. I'll never forget the day we got the call. Um, came back and said, this is the same man whose DNA was found on the crime scene. After all this time, it came down to a cigarette butt to finally identify who murdered my mother. You would think it would be the mystery solved, but the prosecution is not exactly ready to admit defeat at this point. Exonerating Clarence Elkins and reopening the investigation would require more than scientific proof. Clarence Elkins can't be freed immediately. I couldn't wrap my head around that. This time, Mark Godsey isn't taking any chances. Before taking the evidence to Summit County prosecutors, he reaches out to an unlikely ally for support, Ohio Attorney General Jim Petro. Would be unprecedented that an attorney general would cooperate. I said, good luck. The gamble pays off. About an hour or so later, Mark called me back, said they're willing to look at this. Going through all of the information that we had, my entire criminal justice staff, a staff of felony prosecutors, homicide prosecutors, people who'd been engaged as prosecutors their whole career, we came to the conclusion that there was an injustice and that Clarence Elkins was innocent. Mark Godsey had called me and said, you know, Jim Petro and his staff are on our side. The Ohio Attorney General taking your side, I mean, the, there's no greater credibility there, folks. It was just unbelievable. No other state attorney general has ever come out for a convicted killer in favor of them, ever. And now, the prosecutors can no longer dispute the accuracy of man's DNA sample. Earl Mann was in prison. We had his DNA. So we were able to match that with the DNA that uh, was taken from the cigarette butt. I got a call from the lab with new DNA results, which greatly increased the odds that Earl Mann was a perpetrator. At this point, it went up to something like 1 in 19 million. Jim Petro calls a press conference. They're going to announce that they're just dropping all charges against Clarence and seeking his immediate release. 20 days before Christmas, Melinda Elkins makes the phone call she's been dreaming of for over seven years. You ready to come home? Then get your stuff packed, honey, because you're coming home today. <laughs> What do you think of Melinda's efforts? Melinda is, is, is very courageous and, and, and a strong person. And uh, she never gave up. Based on the DNA evidence, Earl Mann is indicted for the murder of Judy Johnson. No charges are laid against Tanya Brazil. I remember screaming, like, I can't believe that my sister finally found the person who did this. Guilty. She had help but she's the one that never gave up. Man is sentenced to life in prison. I think it was unfair and the prosecutors put me in the position that they did. I basically put my uncle in prison, but my uncle Clarence said he didn't blame me. Earl Mann was now convicted, but it was sad because the bottom line is my mom will never be able to come back. My mom's gone. Clarence Elkins would still be in prison today if it wasn't for Melinda. I can't emphasize enough how much I admired her courage and her tenacity. This was a, a team effort, but the person who was at the center of it was Melinda Elkins. He was behind bars, but it still hurts that someone took my grandma away from me. I said to my mom, I promise you, I will find out who did this to you. I made good on that promise.